Okay, so we are on to FP2, Chapter 3, Complex Numbers. And this builds directly on from Core Pure Year 1's Complex Numbers. But what we also do here is we delve a little bit deeper into different representations on Argan diagrams. So we've got further loci and further regions. And then we also, for the A2 content, we explore these transformations of the complex plane. And then I'll do some exam questions at the end. And I've just kind of put an example here of what a transformation of the complex plane actually means. You can see in this first one, and we won't do this until later, Later on in the, in the videos. Um, the z-plane is with the x and y for the real and imaginary axes and if we have this um, loci here which is the circle that the modulus of z is 3, if we do this transformation we take it from the z-plane to the w-plane by saying that the complex number w is 1 over 3 minus z, it actually changes this red line from a circle that we've got here into this blue straight line that we've got here and the equation of that straight line is just u equals one sixth. So quite a strange thing that happens here and I really like that part of, um, of transformations that we get to with complex numbers. So look out for that part when we get to exercise 3c. So before we even um, kind of do the new stuff, let's just quickly recap the things that we know about from year one with these three different loci that we know about. So the first one is this one that we've got here. Now it's kind of worth just saying that when we have the z, this is the thing that is going to be our any complex number. So we're saying that, well not any complex number, we're going to say the complex number on our loci. So this is the complex number on our loci and actually the singular over loci is a locus and then this z1 here this is a fixed position so that's why on the diagram i've got it as a fixed position like this and what we're saying is that the distance when you subtract them the distance between our number and the fixed one is going to be equal to some constant so if this is the fixed one our one we know i'm going to try and draw a circle and then put it in the right position we know that it will be a circle with center Z1 and radius R that we've got here because we're saying that anywhere on here is our locus and anywhere from Z1 to the circle has the same distance, which is R. So we know this one makes a circle. Now this one that we've got here, it's this same complex, uh, same concept of saying that where we're going to draw our locus is going to be z, and it's saying the distance between that locus and z1 is the same as that distance between that locus and z2. And probably you remember this one, but it's going to be a perpendicular bisector of the line segment that joins them. So hopefully it's going to come out looking kind of perpendicular, but it should look something like this. And the reason this works is because anywhere along this line, it should be the same distance to go to Z1 as it should be to go to Z2. And you can see that distance is the same as that distance. That distance is the same as that distance. It's equidistant anywhere along that perpendicular bisector that we've got. And then this third one that we've got down here is about the argument of Z. And again, this is when you subtract Z1, it's always telling you where the kind of new center is. So we had that new center there. We're going to have the new center here. And it's just going to say that the argument is theta. Now, I've done it with a little empty circle to show that this, that part is actually not included in the locus because a single point by itself doesn't have an argument. So I'm just going to do the parallel to the real axis there. And then I'm just going to say that this locus that I've drawn in blue there that is the argument of z minus z1 being equal to theta. So we've got these three from before, and these are the two new ones that we're going to be looking at for FP2. So we look at a variation of this one that we have here, except for the fact that there is a constant on one of the sides that we might have. If it's completely equal to each other, we get this straight line. We'll see in a second what this one will be. And then we get this more complex one for the argument where we could have z minus z1 divided by z minus z2, and we'll try and figure out what that might give us as well. So I'm going to just start off with this first one, which is our z minus z1 equals k z minus z2. Now, this is saying that the distance between our complex number z, so our complex number z, which is going to be represented as a line of some sort, like it was the locus in the previous part, this part is saying that the distance between z and a fixed point z1 it is going to be k times the distance between our complex number z and a second fixed point z2. Let me just say that one more time. So the distance between all the points on our line and z1 is going to be k times bigger than the distance between all our points on the line and z2. 
Now, previously, we were, they were equal to each other. We were saying the distance between all of the points on this line and Z1 and Z2 is directly equal because there was no K there. So it's the same concept, apart from we're saying that this distance is going to be K times bigger than this distance. In other words, if K is 2, it'll be further away from Z1 than it would be from Z2. In fact, it would be double the distance from Z1 as it would from Z2. Now, geometrically, we could try and build this up from this kind of concept that we have here. But what we're going to do is we're going to find it much easier to do it algebraically, and then I'll try and show you geometrically how that works and why that is still true. So for this one, it says, given that z minus 6, mod the modulus of z minus 6 is equal to 2 times the modulus of z plus 6 minus 9i, use algebra to show that the locus of z is a circle stating its center and its radius. So previously it was a line. Now when you have this part in front, it is going to be a circle, but it needs some algebra to kind of get us to that point that we've got. So when it says using algebra, it's probably usually going to be a good idea to say that z is equal to x plus i y, uh, because then we're taking it into sort of like the Cartesian kind of equation of something that we might have. So z minus 6, that is going to be x, because 6 is a real number, I'm going to write it with the x plus i y. And I'm going to say that that is equal to 2 times the magnitude of z plus 6. So I'm going to put the 6 with the x. And I'm going to put the 9 with the y. In fact, I'm going to put it in straight away and say that it would be a y minus 9 of the imaginary parts that we've got like this. Okay, So I think factorizing these things and grouping them together as quickly as possible is going to make this feel as easy as you can. So all I've done is put the 6 with the real part and the minus 9 with the imaginary part from that complex number. Now, when we take the magnitude, we're going to take the magnitude of this complex number. And you should remember from Corp your year one that to do that, you would do the square root of the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. And then I'm going to have 2 times the square root of the real part squared and make that a bit longer, the imaginary part squared. We remember that if we were going to find the magnitude of z, we know it's just the square root of x squared plus y squared. So we're just applying that same concept to here. Now, you'll probably never see me do this line. You'll probably see me go straight from this line to the next line because there's a square root sign here. There's a square root sign here. It just feels like a waste of time. I'm going to square both sides of the equation. But the thing you have to be really careful of when you square both sides of the equation is this part also needs squaring. So I'm just going to write that down. The 2 needs squaring as well. That's the part that people forget if they skip that line that I've just done, but I definitely would skip that. So it would go to x minus 6 squared plus y squared, because I've squared that whole thing. It's then going to be 2 squared, which is 4. And then there's going to be some big brackets, x plus 6 squared plus y minus 9 squared like this. So I probably would go from that top line to this one. Square it, square it, square it, square it, and square it. Everything needs squaring. Now at this stage, I'm going to do a lot of expanding and just be very careful with the expansions that you've got. So you're going to have your x squared minus 12x plus 36. I'm going to leave the 4 outside the front for a second. We're going to get an x squared plus 12x plus 36 we'll get a y squared minus 18y plus 81. So let's just do a little bit of quick expanding with some multiplication by 4. I do have my calculator if I need it. So that's a 4x squared, a 48x. What's that going to be? I am going to do, I think it's 140, 144. Yeah, 144. We get my 4y squared. Uh, 4 times 18 is minus 72y. And 4 times 81 is 324. So we're trying to get it towards being a circle, right? So that means I need to take all of this stuff that we've got here and try and push everything all onto one side. So I'm going to subtract the x squared so that I get... Oh, I've definitely got something missing here. I hope you were telling me that. I didn't do the y squared that should have still been here. And the reason I wanted that is because I know if it's a circle, there's going to be a 3x squared and a 3y squared. So I suddenly got a bit worried when I was like, oh, no, I'm going to have a 3x squared and only a 4y squared. So sorry about missing out that y squared. So I'll subtract the x squared, so that's going to be a 3x squared. I'll add on the 12x, which will give me 60x. And I'll deal with that 36 as well. Should I deal with that 36 now? 
I'll say I've got my plus 144, my 324, I've added those together, and I'm going to subtract 36. So I have plus 432. I just added this. Whoops. I added this and this, and I've subtracted 36. I'll subtract the 3 of the y squared, so I get 3y squared, and I get the minus 72y from before. Now I'm actually just going to put that 432 at the end there, okay? So I think it looks like everything can be divided by 3. So I'm going to divide everything by 3 so that I get x squared plus 20x. I get y squared minus 24y, and I then have 144. Now, you know what we have to do to try and make this look like the equation of a circle. We need to complete the square for both of these things. So that is going to be an x plus 10 squared, but counter it by subtracting the 100. It is going to be a y minus 12 squared, counter it by subtracting the 144, and there is still the plus 144. So those parts are going to cancel. I'm just going to take that 100 and put it on the other side so that I get 100 is equal to x plus 10 squared plus y minus 12 squared. And they wanted us to show that it was a circle stating its center and radius. So we've definitely got here, we can say hence, it is a circle. We know that the center from looking at these parts is minus 12, 10, minus 10, 12, sorry, minus 10, 12. And the radius is the square root of 100, which is just 10 that we have. So what I wanted to do is show you the locus on an argand diagram or just on some coordinate axes and try and go back to that geometric definition, which was the fact that the distance between Z and 6 is double the distance as between Z and minus 6 plus 9i, because it's subtracting. So let's just see the two points that I've marked, okay? Here is my Z1, which is my 6 that we've got here. That is my 6, 0. And then here is what I was previously calling Z2, which is actually our minus 6 plus 9. Let me just remind you where that came from. It's the opposite, kind of this, the minus 6 and the plus 9 that we've got there. And we've just said that the distance between Z1 and 6, sorry, but the distance between Z and 6 is double the distance between z and minus 6, 9. And you can kind of see that that is true in a few of these different places. So if I just do, say, the easiest one, which is between here and here, you can clearly see the distance between z1 and the locus is double the distance between z2 and the locus. Now, if I just pick any point on this circle, let's do a different color this time. I'll pick this one over here. Now, Obviously, it's just going to be to i. I'm not going to measure any of these things. But again, you can see that the distance between z1, let's get rid of that because it thinks it's a triangle. You can see this distance is double this distance. I'm going to do one more. Maybe I'll do it in this kind of purple color over here. I'll do one more at the very top of the circle. So we're going to see this distance is double this distance that we've got here. And if you've got this printed, you could always measure it and actually see that these things are true. This distance is half of this distance. So it kind of works anywhere it goes around on that circle as well. But I really recommend algebra for these kinds of things because the ge geometric aspect is a lot harder to kind of see from this, okay? So I want you to have a go at this question that we've got here. It says a curve C in the complex plane is described by the equation Z minus one minus eight I equals three modulus of z minus 1. Show that it is a circle and find its center and radius. So pause the video and have a go at this point now. Okay, so we are going to do this one algebraically, like I just said. So we're going to do some algebra for this one. And we're going to use the fact that z equals x plus i y. Now, if you do write z plus y i, that is perfectly fine as well. It just tends to be the way that you'll see it written. So I'm trying to mirror what you might see elsewhere. So I'm going to do this first part, and I'm going to try and do the real part to begin with. So it's going to be the magnitude of x minus 1, because the minus 1 is going to go with the x part. And for the imaginary part, there's going to be a y minus 8. So there's going to be a y minus 8i. It's kind of weird, though, because the i comes before, and then suddenly we put it afterwards when it tends to look like this. But it shouldn't matter. And then we get the 3. Now, this one has only got a 1 being subtracted from the real part, so it's just going to be an x minus 1 
plus i, y, or y, i in this case. Now I said this before, I'm gonna skip the square rooting line. I'm just gonna do everything squared. So it's gonna be my x minus one squared plus y minus eight squared. Don't forget to square the three. And then we get the, and, and make sure that it's that, that three squared is gonna to apply to all of this. So that's the x minus one squared plus the y squared like this. x squared minus two x plus one plus y squared minus 16 y plus 64 equals nine x squared minus two x plus one x squared minus two x plus one plus y squared. So we have x squared minus two x. I'll just collect those like terms together. So we have a one and 64 is 65. And then we have our nine x squared minus 18x plus nine plus y squared. We'll get everything all onto the right hand side. So nine x squared minus x squared, that is eight x squared. Minus 18x plus two x is minus 16 x. I'll deal with the constants at the end. I then have my, did not multiply that by nine, did I? So it's all about looking out for these things as you go. So I knew I needed an eight y squared and I didn't have it. So I get my eight y squared when I subtract. I'm going to add on the 16y from the other side. And then my final thing to do is I've got my 9 subtract 65. So 9 subtract 65 is negative 56. Now, everything happens to be divisible by 8 here, but don't worry if they're not all divisible by the same thing. You would still divide everything by this coefficient. You'll just have some unpleasant numbers to work with. But most of the time, it would be nice if that does happen. So I'm going to divide everything by 8 so that we have x squared minus 2x plus y squared plus 2y minus 7. So that's an x minus 1 squared, counter it by subtracting the 1. A y plus 1 squared, counter it by subtracting the 1. And we get a minus 7. So if I put the 7, the 1, and the 1 to the other side, that's a 9. So we get 9 equals 8 minus 1 squared plus y plus one squared. And it does say show that it is a circle. So we do need to say something like this. Hence, it is a circle. The center is one minus one. And the radius is the square root of nine, which is three for that particular question that we've got there. So in the next video, I'm gonna be looking at the slightly more tricky one, which is about the argument. And we're going to need some recaps from some GCSE circle theorems.